So do you want to start with your name? I'm David Hirschberg. Awesome. Um, where were you born? In Burlington. I was born at the Bishop de Gosbrian. My um, mother's first cousin was Dr. Gladstone, who was the head surgeon at the bishop. And he said to my mother, the nuns have been kind of on my case. All the Jewish kids are being born at the medical center. And the next child, which was me, would you please get be born at the Bishop de Gosbrian because we need some Jewish kids born there. So I was born at the bishop. Did you grow up in Burlington? I did, in the old North End. What was it like growing up there? It was, I was only there until I was six years old. And then in 1938, my dad built a big house here on Prospect Street, two doors down from, from the Ohavazetic Synagogue. So it was a lot more fun growing up here. And, and this particular, where we're sitting, was part of, of the Pullman estate. The fellow that invented the Pullman train, his daughter lived here. And where the synagogue is now was their tennis court. Their mansion in the back was our fraternity house. Um, and the gardens were so beautiful, they were done by Olmsted, the guy that did Central Park. So, and they had a swimming pool behind the synagogue here. And my brothers and I at night would sneak through the woods and jump in the pool when they were when they had dog kennels in the back. And when the dogs started barking, we got out of Dodge and <laughs> jumped out of the pool. But it was fun living in this neighborhood. You never got caught? Pardon? Did you ever get caught? No, never got caught. Um, could you tell me a bit about what your parents were like? My parents were, were interesting. Um, my father was a Damon Runyon character. He came from Lithuania when he was 16, 1912. He said the last thing he remembers his father telling him was, never work for somebody else. Be your own boss, I don't care what you're doing, but be your own boss. So he had a horse and wagon, and he was a peddler, and he worked between Memorial Day and Labor Day. And he was, his territory was up through the islands before they even had a road, they had just a dirt and he would stop at South Hero the first day. And they were not allowed to sleep in the farmhouse. They had to sleep in the barn. So he was there with Jewish, other Jewish peddlers and tinsmiths and, and um, tailors and people who were on the road. And they played poker all night long. And then the next day, they'd move up to, to Grand Isle and North Hero. And then he always made his way back to Vermont by uh, Burlington by Friday night. So, and then, then after Labor Day, he, he became a gambler and just pl played poker all winter long. And my mother was from a really, really poor family. And she was a great student. They lived in the old North End. And um, she went to work at nine to help support the family. And she was an A plus student and she worked nights and, and weekends to help the family. She gave them their first indoor plumbing. She built two, be two be bedrooms on the house, a, be a, a bedroom for the boys, a bedroom for the girls. So she was my grandmother's right, right hand and they had a big family and she helped her with the cooking and my mother was a great Jewish cook. My mother was very conservative and you had to do the right thing. You had to be a good student. You never could fight with the teachers. You had to, be a, and my father was kind of a playboy. He was always handsome, well-dressed. People still talk to me about the, the clothes that he wore. And one of the guys from Hayes and Carney said to me, you know, your father was probably the best dressed guy in Burlington. I said, I know all about it. So he was a duke. My mother was very conservative. It wasn't the world's best marriage, but in those days people didn't get divorced. So it was, it was just, I mean, the, the one common thread was they both loved the children, but as, as far as liking each other, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Were you close with your grandparents? I was. My grand, I didn't know my grandfather. He died when I was two. But my grandmother, that, that part of the family moved to Detroit. And because I could speak in a little bit of Yiddish and understand, in the summer I had an uncle who became very wealthy in the shoe business, and he moved the whole family to Detroit. 
And so I would go for a month and a half and spend the summer in Detroit with my grandmother so that she would have somebody at home with her because the oldest son was this handsome guy who liked to play golf and had a string of good looking women on. So he, we would, I would go into the shoe store with him in the summer and then he had box seats, the Detroit Tigers. I'd go to the game, come home. We'd go to the Sydney Hill Country Club for a massage and, 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 and steam bath. We'd go for a steak dinner. He'd send me home. And then the next morning, my grandmother would say in Yiddish, no, when, did, when did Uncle Bill get in? I said, right after you went to bed. It wasn't true, but, but that was okay. So those are my summers. And then she would come back to Burlington with me and she'd spend the Jewish holidays in Burlington and then she'd go back to Detroit. So I was very close with my grandmother. She was a lovely, lovely lady. Um, and I never saw a family that showed such respect. Her six children adored her and rightfully so because she was really terrific gal. You said your grandmother came home every high holiday. Did you have, here, yeah. here. Did you have any other high holiday traditions? Well, we were kind of like three day a year Jews because we went to services on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So I always remember, my mother always wanted us to look sharp. So we always had something new, a new sport jacket, new pants, tie and jacket. So you always had something new. And my mother was a great Jewish cook. So the house was always filled with the food. My dad was really proud of how great a cook she was. So he would often sneak away from services with his buddies because there was always scotch in the house and they'd come back and my mother would come home from Hebrew from the services and find the refrigerator pretty well cleaned out because he and his buddies were drinking scotch and, 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 and eating good gefilte fish and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, I, I remember the holidays very well and because that was one of the few times I was really going. I mean, I went to Hebrew school every day, but going to services, very little. And, and my parents went very little. Do you remember any of the highlights for high holidays, any part of the service? Well, the synagogues were so loaded with people that the, the Ohav, Ohav Zedek synagogue wasn't big enough to hold everybody. And there was an old synagogue across the street called Avram Garam. So for those three days of the high holidays, other people like my, my parents would go to the Avram Garam because early on in the 1920s, I think, my grandfather was the president of that Avram Garam. So my father felt a loyalty there. So for those three days, I always remember sitting with my father during the high holidays at Avram Garam. So the only time I was really in OZ was I was bar mitzvah there. My brothers were bar mitzvah there. I remember the rabbi who was there. Um, the women, of course, because it was an Orthodox synagogue, they, they couldn't sit with us. They had to sit upstairs. And it didn't really become a conservative synagogue until Rabbi Wall came. In fact, I, I think there was a story that his first sermon when he came to Berlin, when Rabbi Wall came after World War II, when his first sermon was in Yiddish, and that just wasn't going to work for him, and he was ready to get get out of Burlington, and they they talked him into staying because they knew the younger people knew in order to keep the congregation vital and alive, they had to change from an Orthodox synagogue to to a conservative synagogue where there was more of the service, and that's when they built this building. This is backtracking a tiny bit, but do you remember, or what was your earliest memory ever? Ever? Ever. Well, I, I remember growing up, you know, in the old North End, I had these two older brothers. Um, I remember going to H.O. Wheeler, which was the school a block from our house in the old North End. Um, and my brother was, my next oldest brother was the captain of the patrol. And I remember in those days in kindergarten, the teacher played the piano, you had a rest period. Everybody had a little rug, you slept on the rug for a few minutes. And my brother was always in the window of the door making faces, trying to try to, but I remember that. I remember going to grammar school and, 
And then we moved up on the hill uh, when I was six years old. Where were some of your favorite places to go, whether in the Old North End or on well, Prospect Street? We, we went around the corner. Mount St. Mary's had a hill, which wasn't a very big hill. But for a six-year-old, we thought it was skiing in the Alps. So we used to have toboggans and sleds. And in the winter, we, any time we had time, like on a Sunday, we'd go sliding and tobogganing on the Mount St. Mary's Hill. I mean, nobody had money in those days, so you weren't going up the stove to ski, but sliding on a sled or a toboggan was a big deal. Dude. My mother, conversely, there's a huge hill out here called Fern Hill. She said when they were kids growing up, they were immigrant kids, and they didn't have anything. So they used to go to a, to a dairy place that made cheese, and they had these big cans, and they would flatten them out, and that would be their sled. They'd go to the top of Fern Hill, and they'd slide down, and the only thing they had to worry about was the trolley coming by with a horse. <laughs> So they would, they, would, they would slide down Fern Hill, down into the interval. So that was their sliding hill. But I mean, I, I, I always liked school. Um, I wasn't crazy about Hebrew school. That, that wasn't a comfortable place for me. And you had all this energy. And the last thing you wanted to do was go to public school all day long and then go to Hebrew school from four to six. So we all went, but none of us, I don't think, really liked it that much. Do you have any really good memories from Hebrew school? Well, there was a, like a little, a little area in the back and we put out four, four bases and we used to, you, it wasn't big enough to play softball or baseball, but we played punch ball and we, and we do that every recess or, be, or anytime we weren't in class, we'd run out in the back and play punch ball. So it was, that was a fun thing. And then we had downstairs in the cellar of the, of the Hebrew school in the winter, we had like a little wire hoop and we played basketball and the basketball was only a, a tennis ball. So I always, I, I like recess. <laughs> that would be my favorite part. <laughs> um, was there anything special about your neighborhood or community? that really sticks out? In this neighborhood? Whether North Prospect or... Oh, Prospect Street. Well, or then, North Union. then we became, like we had this freedom. We had bicycles and we could go everywhere. We could go to swimming holes with a bicycle. We could, there was a big uh, f field up near Mount St. Mary's where we played baseball. We didn't have Little League, but we probably got to be better players than the Little League kids because we played every day. Whereas Little League, you had uniforms, you, you, get, you could play only a certain number of innings. So those kids maybe played four innings in a week. We played 50 innings each day. I mean, so there were a lot of kids in the neighborhood. So it was a great place to grow up. You had your bicycles, you had your sliding, you had softball, baseball. Yeah, it was fun. Was it mostly Jewish kids or mostly non-Jewish no, kids? No, up here was very few Jewish kids. My father, I think, was only the second family. There was a guy named Alex Kolodny that had a huge supermarket. He had a brick home right on the corner, and we were across the street. So not many of the Jewish families had, in the 30s when we moved up, had come, come north. In fact, there were some areas like Colonial Square across the street that was restricted. Jews couldn't couldn't buy homes there. You, we talked about this earlier in the other room, but could you talk a bit about walking back from Hebrew school? Hebrew school was tough because the kids, there were bullies that would wait for us to beat us up going, going to Hebrew school. And my mother said to me, and she had these tough brothers, and she said, my kids don't run. And so I was a pretty good fighter. And even if I got beat up, I would fight so hard that they left me alone. And, and the mothers would call my mother and say, they leave David alone. So could he walk with Stevie and Richard and Howard? And so I became kind of their pr protector because they left me alone. But it was, it was tough because they didn't like us. And, and we had, it was in a tough part of town. It wasn't here, it was down in the old North End. And um, 
The older brothers never ran into that because they weren't depression babies like we were. They had huge, huge families. And so there was a strength in numbers. We were the depression babies in the 30s, small families, and you didn't have, and you had a couple of guys who were students that weren't fighters. So I didn't have a lot of, a lot of protection. My brothers had a lot of guys in their, in their group, so they didn't have the issues. Were there any community scandals that you remember? Well, my father was a gambler, so I think there were a few of those gambling joints that were raided <laughs> in the days when, when he was playing. Uh, but I, I can't remember any particular. I think they all tried to be pretty good citizens. My mother was very active in some of the organizations. There was a sisterhood that was really important, and they did a lot of fundraising for the synagogue, and they were like the the social heart of, of the synagogue. And so she was really involved in that. And, and it gave the women who had these large families a break. They would do luncheons and bridge and, and, and played mahjong and stuff like that. So that was kind of like the social life of Burlington. She was really involved in that. And because she was so poor growing up, she, had, she was in an organization called Ladies' Aid, and she was one of the she was one of the really important people. And she was so proud of being an, an American and having the freedom of being able to go to synagogue, have your own business, not have the Russians come in and conscript you for the Russian army. So she went to the, there were a lot of Jewish merchants. So she went to the various merchants and asked for things like year old boots or, or mackinaws or hats or gloves so that no Jewish person would ever be on welfare. She didn't want us to have that stigma. She wanted us to take care of our own. So if she knew a family didn't have food, she'd make sure that they would have food. So my mother was, while she wasn't a synagogue gore from the service standpoint, she was very vital to the synagogue with those two organizations. And my dad also didn't really go to service as much, but he was always there if they needed money for something. Um, what was the broader Jewish community like? They were very, it was a very orthodox community. Um, you had the, a lot of these immigrants, like my parents, who were born in the old country. The kids became very successful because their parents knew that the way to get to the top was education. You had to do well. So those kids did very well in school. Their parents were very on top of them making sure they did well in school. And, and so when World War II came, those guys all went into the service. But once they saw Paris in London, they weren't coming back to Burlington unless their parents had a business like we did. So most of those kids never came back to Burlington once the war was over. But it was before that in the 20s and 30s, those families were very, very close and most like my brother, all their friends were mostly Jewish. In my case, because there were so few Jewish kids, and because I played on different teams, I had a lot of friends that weren't Jewish, and that was fine. Do you think there was a difference between how? Do you think there was a difference between how your brother grew up with a lot of Jewish friends versus how you grew up with slightly less Jewish friends? I would say, yeah, they were very, very tight. They were very close together. There was, you know, I think most of those guys ended up marrying Jewish women because there were big families and, and they had a, a girlfriend to come back to after the war. In our case, you know, I went to school, maybe a couple of Jewish women. I don't think I ever dated until I got, until I went to university. I don't think I ever dated a Jewish girl. And my mother used to have restrictions. You can date the same girl twice, but that's it. So, so she was watching me. But, but once I went to UVM and I was in a Jewish fraternity and the Jewish kids at UVM hung together. And it was, so it was, for me, it was kind of a, a revelation. When you were part of your fraternity, which fraternity was it? Phi Sigma Delta. When you were part of it, um, would you guys go to services together? Or would you have your own services? Rarely. I can't remember. 
we'd go to basketball games together. We'd, we'd go to the old mill in Winooski and have a beer together. I don't ever, I mean, the first couple of days of the Russia, Russia Shunner Young Keeper, they would come to services because they wanted to eyeball the new freshmen that came in. But uh, other, other than looking for, for dates, I don't remember them ever. Like my, my wife became a very, very important member of, the, of OZ. She became the first woman president in 1985, but when she was, she, her family were, were, not, were not very religious, but she knew she wanted to meet Jewish people. So the first place she came to, not Hillel, but was OZ to see who was coming here for Rosh Hashanah services. So that was, yeah, they had always come to services the first two or three weeks of school. <laughs> and once they found their dates, they, you know, they, that was it. Yeah. Um, was there, so you attended, sorry, when you were younger, you attended Chi Alpha, not Chi Alpha, I'm so sorry, um, Chi Adam, and then that became OZ. Could you talk about no, that transition? No, OZ was a separate synagogue, and that was there before Chi Adam. The story goes that there was a very wealthy guy named Levin, who I guess either couldn't get an honor or couldn't get an aliyah. He wasn't happy in OZ. He built Chai Adam. So because OZ was so busy during there were so many people, it was too many people for, for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, they opened up Chai Adam for three days a year until 1939. So from the time I was born until the time I was seven years old, I used to go to the high holidays with my father and mother at, at, at uh, Chai Odom. And then... And there was a third synagogue, too, a little further down the street. Um, and I, I don't really know much about that synagogue. I don't think it lasted very long. Was that the Red Brick Synagogue? Or? No, it was, a, it was a, as I recall, it was a white, it was a white synagogue. It became, in fact, it was an African-American guy that ended up owning it. And I think he used to detail cars, wash cars at that building. But it didn't, I don't think it lasted very long. Did you get bar mitzvah in the red? I, in, in, I got bar mitzvah in OZ in 1945. What was that process like? Yeah, well, I mean, you had to study a lot because in those days you had to do the whole off there. It's now you can either say a line or two lines, or you can even have a bar mitzvah on a, on a Saturday afternoon, say a couple of prayers and that's it. But in those days you had to do the whole deal. So you studied for weeks. In fact, I remember my, my, my Hebrew school teacher was a guy named Harry Kahn, who had just was lucky enough to escape the Nazis. He came here and he became a, a professor at the University of Vermont. But before, before that, he was a Hebrew school teacher. And so he taught me my bar mitzvah. But I remember one Saturday, I had a lesson after services, and I rode my bicycle down and he chastised me. He said, you're only three blocks away. You couldn't walk. You have to ride a bicycle. You know you're not supposed to ride a bicycle on, on Sabbath. So I never, any time I ever had a lesson from Harry Khan, I made sure not to take my bicycle, but he was a good guy. Um, did you have any friends who went to the Red Brick Synagogue or not? Oh, really? sure, sure. There were the, uh, Richard Alpert was a dear friend of mine, uh, Howard Klinkelstein. There weren't many, um, but, you know, and we, we usually went until we were bar mitzvah and then we'd quit. But then the next group that came along, like the scholars, like our friend Jeff and, and guys who went to med school, they went to, when Rabbi Wall, he had kind of encouraged them to go to Hebrew to an advanced school. So they went even to like a junior high school or a high school. So those kids, they, went, they didn't quit like we did. When we were 13, we couldn't wait to get, out, to, get, to get out of Hebrew school. But those kids went for two or three or four years and they all ended up being doctors and professors and whatnot. Did you ever attend a bar mitzvah at the Red Brick Synagogue? Oh, sure, plenty of them. What was that like? Was it, it any it was very. It was a very joyous occasion. It was packed usually. And when the service was over, they went around the corner to the Hebrew school. Uh, upstairs, they had a social hall and a little kitchen as big as your closet, but they put some amazing meals out and they always had big bar mitzvahs there, if they could afford it. If not, 
there were people who made sure that there was at least a party for the kids. Do you remember any of your favorite meals from then? Oh, my mother was a great Jewish cook. I mean, she made two or three different kinds of simis. She made blintzes. My mother made her own bagel. In those days, the only time you could get a bagel in Burlington, there was a, a Goldberg's Bakery on, on the Old North End, and you only had bagels on Sunday, and you had one kind, a plain bagel. And I used to salivate on a Thursday coming home from school in the winter because my mother would bake bagel every Thursday. And I couldn't wait to get home to a nice bagel with hot butter, with butter and, and hot chocolate or something. Yeah, my mother was a great cook. But anything my mother made except gefilte fish, I hated. And every Friday night, the two of us had a fight. Every night she'd put it, every Friday night at Sabbath, she'd put gefilte fish in front of me. And I'd say, Ma, I don't like it. She said, everybody loves my gefilte fish. I said, that may be, but I don't like it. Um, did the Red Brick Synagogue have any reputation or what was it known for? Well, I think the Jewish population was very well thought of because they had a lot of businessmen. They had a lot of, by that time, they started to have some professional people like my mother's cousin, Dr. Gladstone, was the head surgeon. You had the Lisman family who were lawyers. You had a guy named George Eagle who was the first Jewish lawyer, I think in, in Burlington. So I think it was a well thought of community. Um, there were, there was, in addition to so many merchants on Church Street, North Street was like a little Jewish shopping center. So you had three or four stores on North Street, like the Maisels, the Bloombergs, the Franks, where they had different stores. So that was like our own little shopping center in addition to Church Street. And that's where my mother, when she was helping with ladies' aid, she would go to the different merchants. And my mother was a hard woman to say no to. And so if they had any clothes from the year before or boots or anything, she was able to get it. To, so I think the Jewish people were pretty well respected because uh, I think they tried to be good citizens and I think they really did a lot to help build Burlington. Are there any other memories that you have that you'd want to share? Well, there was, there was um, an area in Burlington called Sand Dunes. It was beyond the, the public bathing I mean, North Beach was a regular public bathing, but there was a place out in the bay called Sand Dunes. And for some reason, a lot of Jewish people had cottages there. So that was kind of our swimming hole. They were very, very generous. They allowed all the Jewish people to go, and it was a sandy beach with a sandy bottom. They even for a, one summer had a, had a little hot dog restaurant there where you could get a, a burger or a hot dog. Um, so I have fond memories of swimming with all with my friends at Sand Dunes. We used to go on, our family used to go on a lot of picnics. We'd go to different state parks and my mother would pack a big bag and we'd, and we'd swim and, and stay there for dinner and then, and then come back, drive back home. So we weren't campers, but we were picnickers. Were there, any other Jewish clubs? I know you said there was one in um, Detroit, but any Jewish clubs in Burlington? There was a, um, uh, um, a, a group for young men called AZA, and it was kind of an intellectual place. We did things, uh, we'd go to conventions, and we had some orators who won the debating, and, and we did things like that, but we always had terrific athletes. So the AZA group, they had a church league at the YMCA, and I think 1945, 46, and 47, the first three years of the church league, we won the, the OZ won the church league. We had really good basketball players, and we always had somebody at the Burlington High School team who was Jewish. Buck Hard was our coach, and he loved the Jewish kids. In fact, when we would get in a huddle, you know, some, place, some places they would touch some kind of a lucky thing. He always had a mezuzah. So, so even the kids who weren't Jewish, everybody, they probably didn't even know what it was, but everybody touched the mezuzah for good luck. So I can't remember a Burlington High School team that didn't have one or two Jewish kids on it. So we were always good basketball players. Those are very fond memories for me. Um. And then later on, 
when we got older and we got married and had children, uh, we used to play, the men used to play softball every Sunday. And sometimes it was the, the vets who would come back from the army against the young punks like us who were 15 and 16. And uh, we used to play softball every, every Sunday and that was fun. What were the age ranges for that? For softball? Yeah. Well, we had uh, your friend Jeff Potash. We had f his father, Milt, who was a professor at the university, who was the best player on the team, on everybody's team. And he was, Milt must have been in his 40s by that time. He was the fastest runner and the, and the best player on the team. So it was very rare that the young guys would ever, would ever beat the older guys. So yeah, it was, it was all different kinds of ages. But, but it, was, it, was a fun, it was a fun thing. Are there any questions that you think I missed? I think you did a good job. I think you did a really good job and it's, it's a pleasure, it's an honor for you to ask me these questions. Thank you. Um, are there any photos or artifacts or artwork that you have and would wanna share? I, I, I don't think so. I, I mean, I think everything we had we gave to the to the historical group. I think some of those things were on the little, that PBS special, that little, little Jerusalem. We had some trucks from my, some pictures of my dad's truck from, from the business. But I don't, I can't really remember having anything like that. Are there any questions that you think I missed that I should ask? Well, I'm, I'm just curious about um, clergy and how the, your memory of the rabbi or the cantor or anybody uh, I'm thinking of... Uh, well, at the old shul, the cantor was a great old guy, Reverend Nadelson, who had a wonderful voice. He was a local guide. I don't think he was an educated guy. I don't think he went to rabbinical school, but he was the chazan. He was the cantor for many, many years. But rabbis kind of came and went. This was a hard community. I think they were very, a lot of old immigrants who were kind of difficult to deal with. So I remember kind of until Rabbi Wall came and he was here 40 years, I think rabbis kind of, and Hebrew teachers kind of came and went, you know, the, I, I think there was a, a whole group of revolving door of rabbis coming. I remember my rabbi was, his name was Rabbi Herman. I don't think he was here very long. And I think, you know, it was an Orthodox community. They, they spoke Yiddish. The services were not child friendly or kid friendly. They were they were 99% in Hebrew. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of memories of going to services, unfortunately, I'm sorry. Uh, I wish you had somebody who was more religious. My mother kept a strictly kosher home um, and we went to Hebrew school. Um, and I remember there was a wonderful professor who lived around the corner, Mert Lambden, who was the head of the men's club. And he would stop at the house every once in a while and try to grab me or one of my brothers to go to services because you had to have 10 people for a minion. And, and um, if we saw him coming, I think we'd hide because <laughs> it wasn't where we wanted to be. We'd rather be out sliding or playing ball or something. But he was a wonderful man. He was a hard man to say no to because he was a gentleman. Were the rabbi or clergy or cantor, were they involved with the Hebrew school or not really? You know, that's a fair question. And, and I don't remember the rabbis. We had teachers and I remember the names of some of the teachers, but I don't remember the rabbi, at least when I was in Hebrew school, the rabbi ever getting involved with the Hebrew school. But we had one guy named Jake Ketchum I uh, remember him, uh, he was quick with the ruler. If you, if you weren't behaving out with the ruler and slamming your knuckles, and I had one of my friends jumped out the window one time. So uh, uh, Hebrew school was pretty raucous. I mean, they had their, the teachers had their hands full because that was the last place we wanted to be. After being in school all day long, the last thing I wanted to do was to walk to Hebrew school and have to fight my way there and fight my way home. Uh, that wasn't fun. Uh, so, you know, when I, when, when I became 13, I was getting out of Dodge. I said to my mother, I'm done. Uh, and she couldn't really keep us in there after. But the, the more studious guys that came along after me, they, they went to Hebrew school much longer. Anything else? I think that's it. Thank anyway. you. Anyway. <laughs>
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You are a rare beauty. Thank you very much. Is that on camera? <laughs> Sure is. <laughs> well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, Kevin, thank you. Yeah, that, oh, that was awesome. I mean, that, that's just that's a good part of the story of this place that you that know, again, awesome. as we as we you know we've got the, the mural, we've got the right. art, we're creating a museum. Um, you know, we're really trying to preserve 140 years worth of history. Well, we're lucky to have this guy as a president. Let me tell you, he's the best we've had. He's he's amazing. We're well, lucky. And here's an, and here's a story that, that you know that probably bears witness to your mother is that I'm here because of my mother. You bet. <laughs> my my father, when my mother passed away, my father wanted her remembered here. So that's my. Well, your father was a good man. Yeah. He was our. When we were at UVM, he was everybody's favorite professor. He, the two Milts, Milton Admirty and Milt Potash, were, were our advisors at the fraternity. They were great. My dad was all of five foot four when he was in the war, and he played sports. They called him Cannonball Potash. He was fast. He could run, and he could hit the ball, and he could catch it. But Burlington High School had an amazing history of Jewish athletes. My mother's brothers were, I mean, the oldest one, no, he had to quit school to help support the family. But the next two down, one of the guys, Nathan Buckhard, who was the coach for them and for me, said he was on a football team that never lost a game or had a point scored against them. And he was the center and linebacker on that team. He was a killer. My, my uncle Sutka, did they call him? Never, nobody ever called him Sam Brown. It was always Sutka, his Jewish name. He was an all-state halfback, all-state basketball player, all-state catcher in baseball. So they had an amazing group of Jewish athletes. Well, that raises a point in which I've forgotten. Names. Everybody had a name. Everybody. They had a guy named, they had a guy, there was, there, was a, there was a roller skating rink out in the bay, and they had a pie eating contest. And there was a guy named Louis Lapido who won the contest. And from that day on, his name was Fresser. Fresser means big eater. So <laughs> he won the pie eating contest, and he never went without, everybody always called him Fresser Lapido. So yeah, people had great names. Did that, you have a name? No. <laughs> no. There was, uh, there, was a, there was a guy named Fleischman who was in the meat business. And he was, all, he was easy to cry. And he was always kind of asking for favors. And they called him Schnudger. Schnudger is kind of a guy who's a, a pain in the butt, who's always sticking his nose. And for all, I've never known him when he wasn't Schnudger Fleischman. <laughs> So they always had these n names. Uh, there was a, there was a guy that had a furniture store named Zayats. He had a son who was a terrific halfback, and he could run like a deer. And he was his name was always Zipper Zayats. <laughs> so, but that wasn't a Jewish name. But they had a lot of guys who had Jewish names. No. Did you? I mean, I remember. There was a guy, one of my second brother's friends, his name was Salzburg, and his family was very poor and they lived on Archibald Street. He came home from school one day, the family was gone. And my brother came home and said to my mother, and his name, and they, and they called him by his Hebrew name, Chaimel. They said, Chaimel has no place to live. His, his folks moved out. He came home from school, they're gone. So he said, so he said, to my mother, can Chaimel live with us? He's got a, so my mother said, of course he can. So Chaimel lived with us for about a year until his folks were up in Nova Scotia and he found them and he had a sister that was living somewhere in New York and she took him, but for six months he lived, he lived in our, he lived in our house. So that was a strange deal. I mean, I guess they were so poor, they just had to, had to get out of Dodge, just had to go. So. 
We did, my mother, my mother did a lot of cooking like Jeff does. My mother did a lot of cooking for a lot of people because she was a great cook and, and, and she knew what it was to be hungry. You know, she grew up in a really poor family. She married a guy like my father who was a great earner, you know. He was a wild man sometimes, but he was playing poker and, and I wouldn't be surprised she instituted some of the raids if he was gone for a long period of time. <laughs> I remember one night, two o'clock in the morning, my mother woke my kid brother and I up and she said, your father's not home and you better go looking for him. Of course, we knew he was at the Elks Club playing poker. So went down to the Elks Club and in fact, it's, it's on St. Paul Street. There's a pizza place down below. For, um, and if you look up on the top windows, you'll still see each window has got a letter. Elk, E-L-K, it was the Elks Club. So we went there and my brother and I went and said, Dad, Mom's looking for you. So one of the guys said, your father's not leaving, he's winning. And my brother was kind of a bruiser. And he said, you wanna stop me? Cause he said, we're taking him home. There's plenty of nights he's losing. So we grabbed him and took him home. So, um, he, you know, he was kind of a wild guy. I mean, he didn't, he didn't read or write. There was no TV, he didn't read a newspaper. So if he wasn't working, he was gambling. And he, he kind of got friendly with a lot of these rich businessmen who weren't Jewish, but they accepted him because he was this handsome guy. He dressed to the nines. And so he played, I don't know where he got the money. I mean, he always earned money, but I mean, they used to play no limit poker, I mean. When we walked into the Elks Club that night, money was piled on the table this high. It was, it was unbelievable. I mean, they, no limit poker, you know. So he, he um, Hayes and Carney was a men's store on Church Street. And he said to me one time, do you remember that camel, care, camel hair? I said, yeah, everybody. He wore this camel hair coat that was so magnificent. And he always had a soft hat and every day of his life, he would go up to a barber shop and get hot towels. I mean, that was the extent. There were no clubs where you could get massages and things like that. So he got a, a shave and a hot, hot towels every single morning and have his shoes shined and his hat blocked. And he, he wore a tie. I never knew him when he didn't have a tie in jacket. I also never knew him when he sat down to the kitchen table when he didn't break out a bottle of scotch and have a sip or two. So, I mean, he, he was different. And it was kind of a kind of a strange marriage, you know. He lived across the street in a rooming house from my grandparents, and he had an eye for my mother, and uh, and he kept asking her, you know, to to marry her, and she kept saying, "I'm not marrying a peddler." I can tell you that. So he sold his horse and wagon, and uh, he got a little panel truck, and he got a little warehouse over on Winooski Avenue and Grant Street, and. From then on in, he was a wholesaler 52 weeks a year. And he, and in those days, almost every restaurant in Burlington was owned by a Greek. And so he really ingratiated himself to the Greek community. And so he had all the, di I mean, there were so many diners in Burlington in those days. And so he had all the diners and all the Greek restaurants. And so they, they had a pretty decent living. They, he was doing okay. I was a lawyer by trade, and I was working for the Veterans Administration, and I was a litigator, and they had me on the carpet every day because they said my claims were too high. I said, am I missing something here? We're supposed to help the veterans. And they said, no, 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 you're supposed to cut them down every time you can. And to this day, the VA, I don't think, takes care of the soldiers the way they should. Uh, and Bernie Sanders is always fighting with them about it. And so they always had me on the carpet. And finally, one day I just said to him, you take this job and you shove it. And I came home and I said to my wife, we're going back to Burlington. And, and I'll always remember what she said to me. You're my husband, where you go, I go. So we came back to Burlington and my brother was furious. My dad had passed on, it was just he and my mother, and they had a small little business. They were, you know, making a living. And he said, their business isn't big enough for two families. And I said, I'll make it big enough. He said, oh, big shot. You don't know an apple from an orange. <laughs> so the first Monday on the job, he gave me a, 
a sales pad. He said, okay, big shot, go out to IBM and see what you can do. So I went out to IBM and in those days they had 385 people, that was it. They had no security, they had no guards. I drove around the back, rang the bell, the chef and the executive chef came to the door. They said, who are you? And I told them, they said, well, we're getting our stuff from Champlain Valley and their produce is terrible and they have Schlitz beer and all they care about is Schlitz. Schlitz is the number one beer in Burlington and their produce is terrible. So he said to me, if I give you an order, when could I have it? I said, you give me an order, I'll be backing up to your warehouse, to your door at 6.30 tomorrow morning. He said, I'm gonna test you. So he gave me a small order. I went in and he said to me, oh my God, this is gold. Am I gonna get this every day? I said, as long as I'm alive, you're gonna get good produce. So as IBM started growing, at one time they had 8,500 people. And everything that went into IBM was ours. And he came to me like after year one and he said, we'd like some frozen foods. Could you bring in frozen food? I said, for IBM, we'd build a freezer. <laughs> so we built this freezer on our warehouse and now we're selling produce and frozen food. The chef said, is there any chance of getting bird's eye? So I called General Foods in White Plains and I said, I have a big customer, IBM, that wants bird's eye, and can I have it? He said, well, we're selling it to Champlain Valley. We're not gonna have two people. So there was a senator named George Aiken in Burlington, and he's very famous for during the Vietnamese War. He said on congressional floor, he said, let's just say we won the war and come home. And people always repeated that. So I called Mr. Aiken, and he came on the phone. I mean, it wasn't like I'm talking to a secretary. He was on the phone. So I said, I told him, I said, we're a small produce company. I've always voted for you. I said, and we're trying to get bird's eye for IBM, and I really want to satisfy them because they're our biggest customer. So he said, well, son, I'll see what I can do. The next day, bird's eye, uh, General Foods called me, and they said, if you want bird's eye, you can have it. So, I mean, that was the connection. I mean, talk about politicians that were close to the constituents. And then a year later, he said to me, would you bring in groceries? I said, I'll tell you the same story. We'll put an addition on the warehouse and we'll bring in groceries. So then we became a full service house. We had meat, we had fish, we had produce, we had canned goods, we had frozen foods. And our two competitors were Vermont Fruit and Champlain Valley. Vermont Fruit, the old man was fabulous, he was a brain, but his kids became the country club set and they weren't workers like we were. So finally they ended up closing their doors. So now one of our main competitors was gone. Champlain Valley had this lumber family and they had one guy who was the head guy and he ran over a guy with his motorboat and killed him. And he got out of Dodge as quickly as you can imagine and the two brothers weren't very good businessmen. So now we were able, I mean, I was the brain maker of our company. It was very easy because you didn't have Vermont fruit anymore. Champlain Valley didn't have the smart brother. So we just kept growing and growing and growing and we became the biggest fruit and produce company. But we had this older brother who was a devil, who was difficult. I had a kid brother living in Boston, he said, is there any way I can come back to the business? I said, your family, of course, is room. So I said to my mother, I said, Eddie wants to come back. I said, but Bucky is gonna oppose it. She said, well, we'll figure out something. So when he came back, my mother and I talked and she said, look, let's open up the ski areas. Let's open up Franklin County because we weren't going in those places and that'll keep Eddie away from Bucky. So that's what happened and Eddie became like I was in Burlington. He got all the ski areas, Franklin County, you name it, we were, and we just kept growing. And so people would go to the older brother and say to him, how lucky you are to have these two brothers that are so productive. And he'd say, they're bullshit, they're nothing. <laughs> he said, without me, they would be nothing. Anybody can sell, I buy such good produce. So, and it became very contentious, very contentious. And then one day, there was a, um, a big, big accountant, Stowe. The guy's name was Michelle. 
and it was the number one place in store where the Kennedys used to go for their vacation. And we kept trying to get in there, we couldn't do it. And finally, Eddie got the account and he was so proud. So he came back and his buttons were popping off his shirt. So we put up the order for the, for the, for the lodge and everything we put was so good. What we didn't know was that night, the older brother came back and took all the good stuff out and put garbage in. And so when the order got there, the chef was furious and he called Eddie and he said, you can never come in here again. And Eddie realized what had happened, that my brother was so jealous that he was able to get that big account. Eddie came looking for him and they got into this fist fight and they almost killed each other. And I said to my mother, Ma, we got to sell. She said, you're not going to sell this beautiful business. I said, Ma, we're going to kill him. One of us is going to kill him because he's such, and we ended up selling the business to Cisco ended up and that they're the largest food service company, but we just couldn't deal with them anymore. He tried to run it by himself for eight months, but it was too big for him. So, but we did fine. We, we ended up, you know that little yellow bus in Battery Park? Yeah. In order for us to get our money out of our business, we had to sign a non-compete clause. So I went to Beansy one day and I said, Beansy, you're getting older. Do you want to sell that hot dog business? He said, yeah. Who's going to buy it? I said, I'll buy it. He said, you're going to sell hot dogs? You're going to come from that big business? I said, we got to make a living for our family. And so we'll sell it and we'll keep longer hours. We'll be open until three o'clock in the morning because there were no Burger Kings. There were no uh, McDonald's. If you wanted a burger or a hot dog at three o'clock, that was the only place open. Plus Battery Park was open. So there were a hundred drug dealers in Battery Park every night. You had seven bars on North Street. So you can imagine what the bus was like. And I didn't hire cooks. I hired guys who were tough guys. At three o'clock in the morning, I wanted Ace Lucas and Skunk Norton and those guys who were street fighters on North Street. I didn't, I could cook a hamburger, I didn't need, but I wanted some protection. So each one of us had a billy club this big. One night, the Hell's Angels decide to take over the bus. And a guy's taking his motorcycle and trying to drive him up, up the front, do front steps of the bus. And we're beating him back. And you call the cops, and the cops would come and see who was there, and they just drove on. They didn't want any part of it. They didn't want, now the cop station is across the street. But it was a tough joint. But we made so much money. It was, we were open from 11.30 and one of the brothers would be work from 11.30 till seven. And then I'd come on at seven o'clock and I'd be there until three in the morning. Then the next week we'd switch the shift, the, or the, the, the um, routine and I'd come in early and Eddie'd come in late. And so we always had somebody watching the money and it was a strictly a cash business. And it was, it was well, we were Coca-Cola's biggest customer. That mean, it, that shows you how big we were. I mean, we just, they were, they used to be, tanks of soda that a hundred drinks in each tank. And we would take a, a bus and you remember, you're too young to remember but this, but Kevin might remember when you walked into a grocery store, they used to have these Coca-Cola coolers that had soda in it with water and ice. We bought two of those Coca-Cola coolers and we stripped the bus, took all the seats out and we had two of those coolers in our bus and we loaded it with ice and we would put 16 bags of potatoes, eight bags of potatoes peeled. We would use 16 bags of potatoes a day. We were McKenzie's biggest customer with hot dogs and hamburgers. I mean, it was, it was pretty an amazing business that we had. And then after five years, our non-compete clause was up and we sold it to Acme Glass, which was right across the street from where our bus was. And we opened up a place on Shelburn Road and we were bigger than Hirschberg's. And my brother had sold the business uh, to Cisco, and we had this amazing business on Shelburne Road. Uh, it was a retail store in the front and called Brothers Two and a wholesale in the back. Every one of the customers, IBM, UVM, that we had before came back to us. But then my brother got really sick and couldn't work anymore. And that was just too much for me. So I ended up selling it and they, couldn't run it either and it went out of business. Uh, but we had a great run there for a while. But it was it was an interesting business. 
Um, but I never felt like I had customers. I felt like they were friends. I mean, I was invited to more weddings. Um, the Chinese people, because one of the Chinese restaurants taught me fanatically how to, um, I had a list of the 20 top items like broccoli, celery, things at Chinese restaurants, and I could count to 10. So one Chinese restaurant would say to the other, if you call David at 10 o'clock at night, he'll take your order. And he never makes a mistake. And they'd, and they'd give it to me in Chinese. And Judy would be, my wife would sit there and she'd say, I don't get this. You almost failed Spanish in college. <laughs> and here you are taking orders at 10 o'clock at night. The China, what they would do is they'd be open until 930. Then they'd call their orders in at 10. And then they'd play Mahjong until 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was pretty wild. But I never felt like I had customers. They were always friends. It was just a different relationship. If somebody, if I'd go to take an order and a guy would say, well, I like an order of beans, green beans. And I'd say, you know, today's not a good day. The green beans really aren't really fresh. But if you want asparagus, it's really at a good price and good quality. So people always felt like I wasn't a salesman. I wasn't there trying to sell them. I was there to help them. And Judy said, for years, she never went into the restaurant with me. In those days, she didn't like cooking. She wasn't like Jeff, who's a great cook. She cooked, but she didn't like it. And so what, what, what happened, you made reservations in those days. So if it was the Park Restaurant or the Black Hat, any of the restaurants that were great restaurants, they'd see my name on the, on the list. So they'd call me and say, you're coming in for dinner tonight. I need a bag of potatoes or I need a bag of onions. So Judy said, for years, she walked in the front door. I walked in the back door with a bag of onions on my shoulder. <laughs> We'd meet in the middle of the dining room. So the, the customers, I mean, it was embarrassing. Sometimes they wouldn't charge me. And I say, I'm not coming here anymore. They said, well, you're such a good friend. You do so many things. I said, I understand, but I charge you for your lettuce and tomatoes. I can't come in and get a steak and not have you charge me. They said, it's different. I said, so, I mean, it was that kind of a relationship. I mean, they'd come out of the chef and out of the kitchen and give me a hug in the middle of the dining room. So it was, a, I mean, it was, I wasn't really a salesperson. It was a, a relationship. So it was, it was really amazing. But the salesmen today say, what you did today, we can't do anymore. Because what they do now, they print out a price list. They don't want to talk to a chef. They don't want to talk to a salesman. They just leave a price list on the counter. And whoever's got the best, it's not anybody talking and telling them what's good and what's bad or, or what they should be buying or what's in season. So there's no real, you don't really build a relationship. I remember one time one of the supervisors from one of the big companies stopped me on the street and they said, is it really true that you speak Chinese? Well, I couldn't say no. I said, well, I know the language a little bit. They said, you know, we don't have one Asian restaurant because everybody says you can't go to an Asian restaurant. David has them all because they love them. <laughs> I remember one time one of the guys said, somebody told me you're a lawyer. I said, yeah, that was a long time ago. And they said, well, my landlord is charging us for an elevator and we don't have an elevator in the building. So I went down to the, this guy, Spray Reagan, that owned a lot of apartment buildings down the street. And I said, you're charging my Chinese guy for an elevator. He said, well, I have an elevator in the complex. They're like, I've got four or five buildings. I said, yeah, I understand that. But that building that you got the elevator in has nothing to do with my guy. My guy's on the ground floor, and there are no elevators in his building. So I said, we're not paying for some kind of an assessment for an elevator. So he said, what do you mean we? I said, he's my customer. He's my friend. And I'm telling you that we're not paying. So they always thought that I walked on water because they said, here, they took it off. They took it off my bill because you said you're not going to pay it. But it was true. The guy didn't have an elevator in his building. The spray Reagan owned three or four or five different buildings, but he didn't own the one around the corner with Hunan's. So I said, we're not paying. So, so they used to say, oh, you go to David. Besides, besides helping you with the water, he'll help you with your contract, with your, contract, with your lease. So it was an interesting relationship we had. And I went to so many Chinese New Year's. It was unbelievable. I thought Judy was going to pass out. One night we went, and one of the restaurants had a huge pig on the table with an apple and the pigs. And Judy said to me, 
I'm not sitting down here. I'm not eating that. I'm not. I said, well, you know, that's a tradition. You know, they think Thanksgiving, they eat lobster, they eat pork. She said, well, I'm not sitting there. So I said, my wife's not feeling well tonight, so I got to take her home. But thank you for, for inviting me. For, thank you. Thank you very much. Amen.